Cool. Thank you, Gautam, for the very kind and generous introduction. Uh, so we had uh, lots of very interesting talks in the day today, um, more about how to use Go well, how is the, what is the right way of uh, writing Go programs. Uh, this is more of a kind of like a history tour. Uh, it's a philosophical talk where I'll talk a little bit about the roots of Go, okay? Or how our past can actually lead us to the future. Before that, who am I? That's me. I'm a language archaeologist, as, as Gautam said. Uh, you can see me right there doing some uh, archaeology work. Uh, this is in, in Turkey. Uh, it's a very nice place. You should visit Turkey if you have not been there before. And I work at HelpShift. And we use Go in production. Cool. So motivation. Why should I really care about uh, learning the history of any programming language? Uh, you know, I, I just have some problem to solve. And I have the language with me. I have a documentation. I have lots of code on GitHub. I can just take all of that and uh, build my solution. And if it works, then uh, I'm done, right? Uh, not really, because <laughs> uh, sometimes if we don't know our history very well, we, we, we are doomed to repeat it, as they say. Right? So if we know our history and uh, know uh, all the mistakes that have been already committed in the past by many, many other people, then there is a chance that we won't commit it again. And, and more than that, uh, we can just build on top of the learnings that the humankind has already had. Uh, Go is a great example uh, of building uh, on the past. And I'll try to illustrate that today in my talk. But uh, before that, a little bit of a segue into the state of software programming today. right? How do we design languages? And how do we uh, you know, design software in general? Uh, so yeah, for, for designing software, uh, we have design patterns, right? So which is the most predominant design pattern that we use today? Is it the builder pattern or is it the visitor pattern? Not really. Uh, I call it the doghouse pattern. Okay, so right there, uh, what you have is a doghouse. Uh, so let's say you are supposed to uh, build a doghouse. How do you build a doghouse? You get uh, you know, wooden planks, uh, nails, and, and maybe a hammer, right? And you keep hammering it away till you have something that resembles a doghouse. And you are cool with it. And it actually works. More often than not, it is the perfect solution. It, it will uh, work just fine for that one dog. But the problem occurs when you know, they say that, OK, it works great. Let's scale it now. OK? It's very easy. Uh, you know, the height, uh, width, and uh, breadth right now is three foot by three foot by three foot. And we just want to build a cathedral now. And it's just 100 by 100 by 100. So it's easy, right? Let's get bigger planks and more nails, maybe more hammers, more people, and let's keep hammering away. That's how we do it here, right? <laughs> uh, but this is what happens once you uh, try to build it. Why? Well, uh, in theory, it might sound very plausible, right? I'll just scale. I'll just magnify all the proportions 100 times, and it should work. Problem is, it doesn't work that way, uh, because even though, even after the scaling, the strength of the building, uh, it does get multiplied by 100. But the overall weight and the, and the mass of the building actually gets multiplied by 10,000. So it's like exponential growth in complexity, uh, and that's why it doesn't scale. So what do we do next? That's even worse. We just said that, uh, hey, we just wanted to build a pyramid in the first place. right? We didn't really want to build a cathedral. Uh, we were trying to build a pyramid, and it's a feature. Um, it's a feature, and then there are lots of libraries to you know, work around uh, all these problems. And to be honest, that's what the Egyptians also used to do uh, thousands of years back. They had no idea about buildings uh, or, or strength uh, of materials and, and physics. So all they could do was to get uh, thousands of slaves, whip them all day, and just get them to move blocks of stone and place them on top of each other till they had 
a resemblance of a pyramid. Uh, but then, I mean, what really matters? It is architecture that matters, right? This is what really allows us to scale our solutions. But what was the key insight? Uh, in, in, so when the Romans came up, came in, and they, they had a key insight in, in, uh, in building and strength of materials, they discovered this key idea, which is the arch. Okay? So this arch, even though it looks very simple, uh, plays a very important role in, in all buildings. Uh, even this building has arches. The stone on top is basically the keystone, which uh, allows the force to be distributed uh, in the whole column, and then it basically stays upright. So as a result, if you really go inside a cathedral, you will see that even though the structure is huge and big, uh, very few materials are used. I mean, it's just mostly made of steel and glass. It's very lightweight, but it lasts forever, and it's huge and gigantic. And you can really use this uh, arch idea to build really big uh, structures. So we have the uh, GG Bridge right there in San Francisco, and then uh, some other structures from all over the world. So Alan Kay, one of my uh, gurus, said that at scale, architecture dominates material. What does it mean? It means that when you are faced with large scale, the language uh, or tools that you have won't really matter as much as how you use them, okay? and how you structure them, what kind of solutions you build uh, using those tools. So just learning a language is often not enough if you are uh, thinking about building medium to large scale systems. <laughs> so yeah. So, so this is what Alan Kay kind of had to say about our field. He said that, I believe that the only kind of science computing can be is like the science of bridge building. Somebody has to build the bridges, and other people have to tear them down and make better theories. And you have to keep on building bridges. Okay? So we have to study existing bridges, existing ideas, take whatever we can, uh, take them down, and come up with uh, solutions which are even better than before. Okay? So that is the motivation for this talk. And I hope that I have you convinced already about learning about the roots of Go. In fact, I'll be talking about the arches of Go. So Go, if you think about Go the language as a very nice structure, it is built on top of many, many arches uh, which predate Go by decades if not more. One pop quiz. Uh, how old is Go as a language? Five, six years? Eight years? I would wager that Go is 45 years old. At least 30 to 45 years old. Because there are some key underpinnings in the language which, which uh, date back to the 60s and the 70s. And I hope to illustrate those core ideas which live in Go even today. Let's start with BCPL. Okay? How many of you have heard about BCPL? We have heard about BCPL as a predecessor to the C language. Uh, BCPL was a momentous moment, uh, day or time in our uh, computer science history. BCPL was designed by Martin Richards in 67 as a systems programming language. Okay? So what were the key ideas? in BCPL. BCPL was the first uh, language which was uh, a bootstrapped language. Okay? It was the first language to have a VM. It was the first language which uh, preferred or, or, or put a lot of emphasis on programmers' productivity. So BCPL actually is a successor to CPL, which is combined uh, programming language. And B stands for basic, uh, where they removed a lot of craft that the CPL language had accumulated over time to make it way more productive. So one of the key ideas that uh, Go borrowed from BCPL, interestingly, so we don't use semicolons in Go, right? But if you read the spec, you will see that the Go grammar actually has semicolons in it. Why? Uh, it, because it makes the grammar simpler. It makes the parser way simpler. 
but at the same time i don't want to keep using semicolons because that's like it hurts uh, my productivity so how do i get bo uh, the best of uh, both the worlds well uh, you get the lexer to inject the semicolon bcpl was the language that championed that idea bcpl2 didn't have semicolons the first hello world was written in bcpl and this is it okay it was it was not from c uh, it actually originated in bcpl so this is how bcpl kind of looked like bcpl was also the first language to have delimiters like this to denote blocks they didn't have uh, they didn't use semicolon uh, braces back then but it's like dollar and parenthesis uh yeah so you can see that the vm idea and the, and the whole semicolon insertion idea uh, actually uh, comes from bcpl in go there are other languages uh, like javascript which do automatic semicolon injection but there is a nice interesting trade off that go designers have chosen which uh, makes automatic semicolon injection way more predictable and less uh, prone to bugs can and can anyone tell me what that uh, trade off is uh -huh. no uh, it's just that you have to put the opening brace on the same line you can't uh, put it on another line the code won't even compile okay next up is uh, modular 2 designed by nicholas worth nicholas worth also designed another language can anyone name name that language pascal perfect yeah that is the answer so modular 2 uh, is a successor to pascal nicholas worth uh, kind of wanted to build a, a language which was more advanced and more mod more modern modular 2 later was also succeeded by oberon which embodied the same ideas uh, and i think came 20 years later the key idea that uh, go uh, took from modular 2 and oberon 2 was the module system so what is uh, unique about go's uh, module system well uh, so there is uh, inside a go module everything is available to all the functions okay and uh, but outside the module only stuff that is explicitly exported is available so in go we do that by you know capitalizing the names of the functions and they are automatically exported um, in mod modular 2 also had the same very similar idea but they the exports was kind of explicit which uh, in in go is much easier to use modular 2 uh, so i mean to just give you a contrast uh, let's if you think about java for example in java modules are very very different like in a java package you actually import a type and not functions right you don't a module in java is not really a collection of behavior it's just one type that you bring in you can't bring in two types also if you wanted without using the star uh, qualifier so yeah so this is another example of how old ideas which were pioneered many years back still live on of course we all know that csp uh, is one of the cornerstones in go language but what if i told you that that's not totally true why because uh, so csp was a is was a paper uh, published by tony or in 1978 and uh, it was a very important paper in our field so back then people were thinking about inter process communication and uh, people were ideating about various ways of doing it uh, one of the most common practices back then was to basically pass around variables as in uh, just state right so so you communicate by sharing state uh so tony ke uh, kind of came up with this idea where he uh designed a totally new language uh, as in an api of some sort where uh you do inter process communication by just communicating so the whole idea is just flip this whole uh, 
communication by sharing memory on its head by sharing memory through communication. Okay. Uh, so a, a minor aside. Okay. So how many people know about this prime sieve uh, problem? Someone? Okay. Some very few actually. So let me uh, quickly explain what really is happening here. So this is called a prime sieve. Uh, you must have heard about multiple other sieve algorithms like sieve of Eratosthenes or Steve, uh, sieve of Atkin. Uh, so this is kind of like a variant of the sieve algorithm. Uh, it's, it was designed by Douglas McElroy uh, again in the 70s. Uh, and then he showed it to Tony Hoare, who kind of illustrated this problem solution using CSP in his paper. So what really happens here is that you have in here a number generator which generates all the numbers, starting from two. To all the, let's say, so the problem here is that I want to find all the prime numbers below 10,000, for example. So there's a number generator which generates all the numbers starting from two to 10,000. And then you have one process here which uh, prints the first number that it gets right away as prime and then filters out every number that is a multiple of that first number. And whatever passes through the filter is passed on to the right neighbor of that process. And the process goes on. And you daisy chain all the processes together. So to find all the primes below 10,000, I would need to have 10,000 processes. In here, this is a short example of just uh, 10 or whatever. Uh, so. In every level, you will see that the multiples get filtered out. And in the end, only the primes survive. So this is the problem. And uh, Rob Pike actually uh, wrote, wrote uh, solved this problem in Go. And it's a very common uh, solution. It's there in effective Go. You can check it out. Or I think Go concurrency patterns. That's where he talked about this solution. Uh, so this is how they solved it in the CSP paper. So kind of you can see that. A go-like thing is emerging there. But there is a very important uh, distinction between modern Go language and what was contained or described in the CSP paper. And I don't know whether you can tell from this example, but the uh, thing is, channels in CSP were not really first class. Okay? So it, channels were not really values that you could create dynamically or pass around or return. There was no such idea of a of having a first class function, uh, first class uh, channel. So in this solution, the channels are actually hard coded. So it is always C from 1 to 100. And you can't say that C from 1 to I to N. Uh, it's, you, can't be, you can't parameterize it. You have to uh, decide uh, upfront. Okay? So this is how they solved it in the CSP paper. You can see that the core ideas were kind of taking shape there. Like, sending messages to channels through this arrow operator. And, uh, and then you will also see that the assignment stuff looks very similar to modern Go. This is actually a heritage from Pascal. Pascal also had this idea of variable declarations and then uh, giving them values. Next up uh, is uh, Newsquick. So Newsquick, uh, so Rob Pike, uh, he did lots of experimentations in between after reading the CSP paper. He also re wrote a uh, tool called uh, PAN, which is a plan line. Uh, some, uh, it was an analyzer for some code. So he basically wrote a DSL of some sort and a compiler. and uh, Using that compiler, they would uh, prove algorithms, uh, like communication algorithms. And uh, the description language for that uh, language was basically CSP. So he did a lot of experimentation with that in the Plan 9 project. Uh, Plan 9 was kind of designed to be a successor to Unix. Uh, there were lots of learnings that the creators of Unix had uh, while they were developing Unix, and they wanted to uh, fix those things in, in, in Plan 9, but Plan 9 never took off. And I think why it didn't do that, I mean, that's, I think, a subject for another talk. But lots of good ideas 
fell out of this whole Plan 9 exercise. Uh, Rob Pike built uh, initially Pan, and then in 1988, he came up with Newsquick. Newsquick, again, is a successor to a language called Squeak. Uh, and, uh, so, but, but Newsquick had this communication CSP ideas. And New Newsquick was the language where uh, channels became first class. Okay? And then uh, we just look at this example. Now this is half a part of the prime sieve solution in Newsquick. Now you'll see that it's already looking a lot like Go already. right? So I have the very similar kind of uh, variable declaration. And look at the type declaration. right? It is almost identical. It's the off part is like superfluous right there. But otherwise, it's very similar. Uh, so this is the main core of the sieve function. So in there, I'm, I do, I'm doing an infinite loop there, and I'm taking a prime from the channel. The syntax is identical, actually. And I'm printing the first value right away. And then I'm making a new channel, and I'm doing the filter again. And the begin, so the begin form that you see there is basically your go. <laughs> in Newsquick, it was called begin. So it would basically spawn a new. Uh, process, and it would run asynchronously. Uh, next up uh, is Smalltalk. Uh, so a lot of people complain about lack of generics in, in Go, right? And uh, even today, I had lots of debates uh, with uh, lots of people here about some deficiency in the language. And ultimately, it was I, mean, I prove, it, prove it to them that it was actually a very well thought out decision. It was not arbitrary. And it actually is more flexible than other alternative approaches. So even on the surface, Go doesn't look a lot like Smalltalk today. But it still embodies a lot of uh, philosophical ideas from Smalltalk. The biggest thing is, is this phrase, which is always uh, used, is composition over inheritance. Okay? Uh, it was actually coined by the Smalltalk team, uh, this whole idea about not doing inheritance to uh, uh, to kind of uh, I mean, you, you, the whole idea was that you don't need a class hierarchy to do uh, composition. Uh, you can, I mean, to uh, add on behavior to existing code. You can do that by just merely using function composition. Uh, and then uh, there are other things like that that still kind of live on in 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 Go even today. For example, the lack of uh, subtype polymorphism. Go doesn't have it, uh, and, and Smalltalk also didn't have it. And they were really opinionated about not doing that kind of a thing. And then also, if you look at the method receiver syntax in Go, on the surface at least, it looks a lot like the message passing syntax that Smalltalk had to offer. And then, you know, a bunch of other languages had a lot of influence. Like I already talked about. Pascal, like uh, the, you know, Pascal was also a precursor to other languages like like Modula too. So the the influence was really kind of deep, uh, and uh, the variable assignment syntax is identical. And of course, uh, lots of influence from C. The surface syntax of Go resembles C a lot, and that's probably because of again, I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? The the creators of Go had a, have a very very strong history with the C programming language. Uh, OK, another question. Uh, it's a quiz. And if you can answer it, I'll give you a t-shirt. <laughs> so the, the three co-authors of Go, Ken Thompson, Rob Pike, and Robert Grissomer, they, at some point of time, wrote compilers for one programming language. Okay, and they learned a lot from that, from that language experience. And some ideas from that language also live on in Go. Can someone name that language? No. So Ken Thompson didn't really write the Sawzell compiler. What does it say? What is the name of the language? APL. Absolutely. Uh, so Rob Pike, uh, Ken Thompson, and Robert Grissomer, all three of them actually had implemented APL compilers in their time. And uh, lots of ideas are still there. For example, the IOTA that we have in our enum or struct declarations, that IOTA concept is actually from APL. When we say for i in whatever, that i doesn't actually stand for index. It stands for IOTA. 
Iota is a function in APL which is uh, analogous to range. Okay, when you say Iota of five, it basically does from one to five. So, so that's the core idea that's still there, uh, and and it lives on. It's very interesting. <laughs> so this is kind of like genealogy that I drew up, and if you look at it quickly, you will see that, you know, Go Go is not really born in 2009. Uh, it has very, very strong influences from uh, languages that uh, were devised uh, in the previous decades. Uh, especially the Algol family uh, contributed a lot to Go. That's why Go is like C. Why is it like C? Because it comes from the Algol family. It cannot look any, any other way. It has to look like uh, Algol. And most languages look like C because they come from the Algol family as well. Uh, so in between, I didn't talk about other experiments that Rob Pike did. So LF and Limbo, they kind of followed the new squeak exper experiment. They also contributed a lot uh, to Go. If, I, if you see Limbo code, it's a lot like Go. Occam was another example. Uh, and of course, uh, there is Simula, which influenced Smalltalk. And then there is Pascal and stuff. So what's the key takeaway? right? Uh, why are we, are we uh, always stuck in this NIH kind of syndrome? Why do you always want to invent things instead of looking back and learning from the lessons that we have already had? That way, we can, we can kind of build on top of stuff that we already know instead of repeating or reinventing the wheel, right? So less reinvention and repetition means more progress, OK? So if you do less of the wrong things, it allows you to do more of the right things that you want to do. Rob Pike said it really, really well. And he said, less is actually exponentially more. Okay? It means that if you do less, if you do lesser binding, if you make less assumptions, it will, it will pay you back in an exponential manner later when you are solving hard problems in production. And I think that is the key lesson to take away from, from learning Go, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? And, and you can't really ignore history, otherwise you'll land up, land up with languages which are really badly designed, <coughs> like JavaScript. Uh, but uh, it happens, right? So let's learn uh, from, from these masters and not repeat our mistakes. Let's go forth and build great software. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>